You are listening to the ODAT Chat Podcast. On this podcast, my guests share their stories of alcoholism, addiction, and how they recovered so that you can too. My hope is that you find the inspiration and resources you need to let go of what's holding you back so that you can transform into the person you were always meant to be. Ready? Here we go. Hey friends, thank you for downloading the podcast. My name is Arlena and I'll be your host. Make sure you subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to hear more inspiring stories about recovery every week. You can also get them delivered right to your email inbox. Just sign up for the newsletter at odatchat.com. So I have two resources for you today. Number one, a workshop for women to solve what can be referred to as, quote, the big domino. It is the one big problem that if solved, eliminates other problems or makes other problems that were previously keeping you stuck, release so that you can move past them. Problems like toxic relationships, self-sabotage, codependency, people-pleasing, and certain types of compulsive behaviors. The problem is your subconscious limiting beliefs. And we start the transformation process in a six-week live workshop called reinvent. The next class starts in October and you can register at selfesteemcourse.com. So this next one is really important. It's National Online Recovery Day. It's approaching on September 22nd and Lion Rock Recovery will be commemorating with their third and final installment of their virtual panel series, Life in Recovery getting sober and staying connected. And this is featuring some amazing speakers. I am super excited for Danny Trejo, Gabby Bernstein, and Jody Sweeten. And it's moderated by today's fabulous guest, Ashley Loeb Blassingame. Ashley is a walking miracle. And I say that because there is no real reason she was able to survive her addiction, but she did. This is one of those conversations where I walked away thinking, how is this woman even alive? But not only did she survive, she is absolutely thriving. She's been doing amazing work, getting resources and the help to those who need it most. She's also so much fun to talk to. So I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Ashley. Okay, Ashley, thank you so much for joining me on the Odat Chad podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. We had so much fun on your podcast. I was like, oh my God, I think that was the best interview I ever gave because you just brought out the best in me. So thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. It was so much fun. So you're like 95 episodes into Courage to Change. Yes. The name of your podcast is Courage to Change. Yes. Yes, we are. Uh, We started in 2018. No. 2019, 2019. And, um, we're in season two and it has been really, um, fun and honestly a labor of love. Um, and we've just had more, honestly, we've had more content than we've been able to put out. So it's been a weird, (laughs) it's been a weird experience that way, but it's been really great. I have a wonderful That's amazing. Yeah, no, you guys are doing a great job. I mean, it does, it is a labor of love, right? Like you said, Mm -hmm. um, the, the intentions are pure. You want to get the message out there. You want to help as many people as you can. And sometimes it's like, hello, is this thing on? (laughs) Totally. Anybody? I'm like, Hello, hello, hello. joking yeah, around about totally. that Demi Lovato at the Grammys did that. <laughs> is anybody listening? No, I know, I know. Isn't it funny? I I feel like there's always a place in your life where you could pr- take a song like that and cry and like listen to it and cry by yourself. Yeah. Um. Or I I can't be the only one that's done that. No, um, ma'am. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's totally like. Is anyone out there? The only way I. So we get some people respond, which is cool. And I've, um, I've gone in and talked, um, to a group of women who listened, who wanted, who then wanted me to come talk in their group. So that was cool. And then from our downloads, I mean, and like, it shows where in the world they're downloading, they're downloading in places where like, I don't want to know how my message is being translated there. Cause there's like places in rural China 
Yeah, I don't know. So I I get the stats too, and the podcast is being downloaded in 53 countries. And I'm like, all these tiny little places. I'm mm-hmm. like, I just imagine that there's probably some like American traveler who's just trying to stay sober and listening to to podcast. I mean, that's that's what I imagine in my mind. I would be so surprised if there was like English speaking people in Uzbekistan who are trying to stay sober. Maybe. I mean, maybe. Yeah, it's probably expats, but yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's just a wild experience. It's been really fun. It is really fun. And and at the end of the day, it's like you just do what's on your heart and you put it out there and then let people, people will do with it what they want. Like once it's out in the mm-hmm. wild, you just never know. Yep. Yep. So that's super cool. Okay. So I'll be sure to leave a link to uh, the Courage to Change podcast. So, so you're actually... Did I see the chief people officer of Lion Rock? Is that, <laughs> I love that. Yes. Yes, chief. Yeah. Um, I have designed all of our hiring, um, recruiting uh, processes. So staffing the entire co- company from the beginning, which in the beginning was not a big job. Um, and now it is a big job, which is a, a fun, weird experience in and of itself. But basically, I, I work I, I work on all of the recruiting, staffing, and then culture um, things, trying to create and maintain the culture of what we started and and making that a serious priority because um, the three co-founders, we do not want to work at a company without that culture. And so that's a big piece of what I do and think about. That's very cool. Do you want to describe a little bit about your company and the culture that you're sure. working on? So in 2010, uh, my aunt, my father's sister died of lifelong opiate abuse. Um, her, she had just multi-system failure. It just, her body gave out. Um, she had been to tons of treatment centers, uh, kind of similar to my story. And um, my dad and his business partner were working on um, some solar company. He, they are Silicon Valley entrepreneurs. I grew up in Silicon Valley, yeah. and um, and the short version is that I was on my way to law school. I was working um, at the public defender's office. I had graduated from UCLA, and um, wanted nothing to do, li- nothing to do with treatment or recovery. I was going to stay as far away because um, I started going to treatment when I was 15 and it had been, it had engulfed my entire life. And I had been to so many treatment centers and spent so much time in treatment years, um, years. I, I was in treatment for more than two years uh, total. And so I wanted nothing to do with this, right? I was going to make a name for myself and do something that didn't have to do with my using and recovery. So I started doing consulting work. Um, they wanted, uh, Peter and Ian wanted to do, um, wondered if video conference could be something that could reach people earlier in the process because we were always working with high acuity uh, in the, in the residential space. And um, could we reach, you know, the numbers show there are an incredible amount of people who need treatment and a very small, I, I, I would, I don't, I hesitate to give the numbers because I don't remember them off the top of my head, but the numbers are very small amount of people getting help and very large amount of people not getting help. And how could we reach those? So we started the first um, online addiction treatment program out, outpatient uh, done entirely through video conference. Um, so we were the first substance abuse telehealth company in 2010. So that was 10 years ago. And it was um, not something that people were open to, <laughs> other than the people who really wanted help. And this was the only way they would get they could or would get it. Uh, most most people, certainly people in the industry were not open to it. Um, And so uh, the long and short of it is I joined the team, realizing this is where I was meant to be, that I didn't want to go to law school. And we have grown um, the company from a PowerPoint to, um, I think currently we're treating a thousand clients um, uh, with 50 different time tracks of groups and programs. 
um, clients all over the world. We've treated clients all over the world and uh, we have therapists all over the world. And um, yeah, it's just a, it's just a totally different, you know, well over a hundred employees. It's totally different thing. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, that's, that was um, it's Lion Rock recovery is the name. And um, we, have developed, um, we are now moving into developing and have developed um, a recovery community that offers free online support groups, meetings, useful enter- useful information and entertainment. So, um, and that is lionrock.life. And that is also where you can find um, links to the, all the podcasts um, and our free support groups that are 12 step and non 12 step. That is so needed. And then COVID hits, and everything goes online. So wow, I mean, talk about and you had to hang, I know you had to hang in there through some tough times. I just I just love me a comeback story, right? It's like (laughs) (laughs) persistence. I mean, it's like you got you have such a story of persistence. And Congratulations. I am nothing if not relentless. <laughs> relentless. I <laughs> and love in, it. And in, in many ways, that's great. And in many ways, you know, ask my husband, he's, it's not, it's not always his favorite quality. <laughs> it's a double-edged sword for sure. Yeah. I yeah. totally relate to the relentlessness and it can, yeah, it has a dark side for sure. Yeah, but, side. but, you know, with great, like Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. And Mm -hmm. you sounds like you've learned to harness your powers for good. So I just want to applaud you for all the good work that you're doing. It's so needed. So um, I'm excited to, but listen, we got to talk about this business that you starting treatment at 15 years old. And then (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the fucking hell you put your parents through, I would imagine. My poor parents. Oh. I, I'm still apologizing. Um, and, and every few years, it's like a new profound understanding that I go back to them. And yeah, and well, you're a mom. And, you're a mom of oh. twins. They're three years old, three year old twin boys. Three and a half. Yep, three, three and, and a half. half. Oh my god, they're adorable. I, I saw your pictures of them online. I was like, oh my god, they're so cute. Thank you. Thank but you. Uh, oh yeah, payback's a bitch. <laughs> payback is a payback is a bitch. Well, you want to hear you want to hear relentless payback story. Here's a, here's a classic. So, I being Capricorn firstborn child, um, very you know, relentless, and you know, know what I want, whatever I put my mind to it. So. My husband and I were dating for uh, six years before he proposed, which I was not happy about. Or I'm sorry, it was five years and then six by the time we got married. And I had um, an entire plan of when I was going to get married, uh, when I was going to get pregnant, when I was going to have kids, how many kids I was going to have them by. Like I had this whole, I had my life mapped out and then I just needed to, you know, add the dude. (laughs) And, uh, And so he totally fucked with my plan and my, yeah. And my plan had been to have, um, two children by the age of 30. And, uh, so I was very upset getting married at 28 and, and I, you know, and, and I, we, so when I got pregnant, um, there are no twins in my family. There are no <laughs> twins in his family. Um, and they're identical, I, right? No, they're fraternal. Oh, they are fraternal? Dropped, I, yeah, I dropped two eggs. Oh, you no twins, no twins, no boys in my family. And a complete. And I was 29, so it wasn't an age-related thing. So out of nowhere, and I gave birth to my twin boys a week after my 30th birthday. Well, ask and you so, shall receive. Yeah. So my <laughs> so my dad is always like, Yeah, you can try to take her off <laughs> you know, you can try to take her out of her plan, but she'll find a way. I mean, just That's amazing. It's just so funny. So yeah, I when we got the news that we were having twins, it was I, I told everybody that um, genetically I overdo everything and now there's <laughs> proof. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh my gosh, overachiever. Well, that is amazing that you were actually able to uh, pull that off, <laughs> considering. 
<laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, but let's talk about, uh, let's t- Sarah, do you have alcoholism that runs in your family or is, are you all of it? Oh yeah. Oh, there is. Oh, okay. I have. Oh yeah. There's alcoholism in my family. Um, well, my aunt was, oh, right, right. Yeah. Uh, opiate, opiate addict and alcoholic. And, uh, there's a lot of depression. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, in, in my family with my grandparents, there's a lot of like, they quit drinking. Mm-hmm. I don't, you know, someone yeah. quit drinking and then somehow no one ever talks about it again. <laughs> so whatever that means. Shame, um, shame. Well, I, I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think most people just quit drinking for no reason. Right, my dad yeah. once told me a story that my grandfather like quit drinking when he, you know, came to drunk driving him or something when he was a little kid. And I was like, yeah, that's alcoholism. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm not trying to diagnose, but I, my family is already sensitive to all of my diagnoses. So, oh, um, yeah, so we have a lot of alcoholism mm-hmm. and, you know, mental health stuff in our family. Yeah, that's fair. Um, you know, what I thought we would do is maybe, do you want to just share like your typical experience, strength and hope kind of a thing? And then I'm, sure. I'll pepper you with questions when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or you can, or, or interrupt me. Interrupt you. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, so I was born to, um, New Englanders. My dad, Uh, is from New York City. He is a New York Jew. And my mother uh, was born in Providence, Rhode Island, where I was born. And she is a a New England wasp. If you know the cultures, you know, they're very different. Um, Meaning they're like, um, well, I'll let you describe the the wasp. I think I know what it means. But what does it mean to you? So, for example, um, the so the way that um, the the way that they show love is very very different. Um, mm-hmm. it, the the you know the Jewish side of my family is very open and touchy, hug, you know, hugs and kisses and emotive, whereas um, the wasp side of the family is very reserved, um, not emotional, some amount of physical touch. So. Um, there, you know, the Jewish side of my family, we, we talked about issues. There was a lot, you know, sometimes too much. And, um, <laughs> and then the other side, they don't talk about anything. Um, so there, they, Sweep my that parents, shit under the rug type of stuff. Each, yeah. Under, under the, the Costco rug. Um, <laughs> it's should gone. We, should we define what WASP uh, stands for? White Anglo-Saxon Ang- princess, is it? White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Oh, Protestant. I thought it was princess this whole time. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. No. The girls, like when they said, oh, she's very waspy. I was like, oh, she's a princess. Okay. Got no, it. No, it's, it's Protestant. So it's Protestant. Comes, it's, sorry. It's, mm-hmm. it com- it's, it's basically as white as you get. Um, <laughs> it, it is uh, it, European okay. Um, okay. Protestant and just uh, New England, which is very reserved you know, my mom is five, nine blonde, blue eyes. Um, you know, it's just, a, it's a, she's a very, she's a, you know, a, a stereotype. So <laughs> the a reason that's, in, the reason that that's even relevant here is that I grew up in a household where things were expressed and talked about in very different ways. And so I related more to, you know, the Jewish cultural side of the family and I didn't think my mom loved me when I was a little kid because love was expressed differently. And I didn't understand the different cultures that, you know, no one, that wasn't a thing. So I experienced these two things. And as a kid, I, there was no process for me. And then, um, you know, and then my dad being Jewish, we, um, so we moved to the Bay area. We, we lived in Boston, um, until I was six and a half or seven. And we moved to the Bay area when, when I was seven and I went into first grade and I was met with anti-Semitism. I, I, I didn't know anything about Judaism. I was not, I was baptized Episcopalian. So 
my dad being Jewish was the thing now. And I didn't know anything about it. So these cultural things, these things that separate us or put separated, uh, separated me or, um, were confusing or things I didn't understand. They were a big part of my life because I didn't get the, you know, the underpinnings of what was going on because it was very different. So growing up in a house like that, uh, while it, while they expressed a lot of love, it wasn't always in ways that I understood There wasn't always that consistency. There was a, a very different ways of dealing with things. Um, and for me, that not only was that hard, but I also exploited it, um, to, you know, to, to my, to my benefit. Uh, but the, the, the point in telling you that is that I always felt different, you know, and it's the classic alcoholic story is that I knew that I was different, that something was different about me. And when we moved from Boston to California and I had this curly hair and I had a Boston accent and I walked into a Catholic school, Sacred Heart School in Silicon Valley, where I ended up going to school for eight years, no one would sit next to me because I had this, this accent because I looked different, even though, you know, I mean, I don't look that different, but to them, I looked different. And I, so there was always this like internal struggle and we lived in California and my parents are very new England. So it was always like, I was becoming a Californian and my parents almost disapproved it because of, but, but we lived in California, you know, there was a lot of, you know, undertones of things. Um, I don't think uh, any of that or, or, um, you know, I should say that I had sexual trauma at five um, from a neighbor. Um, I, we lived on the Harvard Divinity School campus and um, the pastor's son, if you can get any more stereotypical. Um, And for me, um, I don't think that made me an alcoholic, but I do think it made me confused. (laughs) And I think that confusion um, led to a lot of other things. Um, I started, I had my first drink when we moved to California and I stole a beer and I drank it in, uh, the closet of the apartment we were renting when I was seven years old. Um, it took me a week to finish the beer and, um, we were waiting for our house to be ready. Um, but so we were living in this little apartment and I knew that you weren't supposed to do it. I, I couldn't tell you what the, the motive other than that was. Like, I just knew that you weren't supposed to. Um, and I would drink things like Robitussin or, you know, I always, you know, incredible amounts of sugar. I mean, sugar really was my first drug. And I always wanted to feel differently than I felt. I did not feel good in my skin. I felt like I was born with my skin too tight. And Um, I think some of that is genetic. Some of that was environmental. Some of it was trauma, you know, it's all mixed in. And at the end of the day, it didn't matter because I found, uh, alcohol and, um, and men and, and drugs that made me feel differently than I felt. And I was able to get into a lot of trouble quickly because I was a 4.0 student. I was head of every club. I played all sports. I did all the things. And the message in my house was, if you do well, like if you have your shit together, then we're not going to get into your business because that's how my parents were raised and it worked okay for them. Um, and so, (laughs) so I hid behind those things. Um, and you know, experimented with, um, weed, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine. I mean, the whole, there's very few drugs that I have not, um, tried. Um, and I was the kid, I was very motivated to do drugs. I went out and sought them. It wasn't like, I always listened to the dare campaign where they're like, just say no. I'm like, no one was begging me to do drugs. Like, where are these people who are just like these guys in cloaks coming out and giving you drugs. Where are they? I am looking for them. I cannot find any of them. It's just like absolutely never happened to me. Never, ever. No one ever was like, please do this drug. I, I, I was so about it. I was so so about that life. Um, so you're like, where's all the free shit? (laughs) I mean, it was, I found a bag of cocaine uh, a few years ago in New York city on the ground. And I was like, 
uh, a little late. <laughs> I'm already sober. What is happening? Party Why, where is was this? over. Yeah. yeah. Where was this years ago? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I, um, I fell in love with cocaine and what cocaine did for me. And, um, I had a really wealthy friend who was also addicted to cocaine and she, we, we started doing over an eight ball a day when we were 15, <gasps> uh, 14, 15. Your parents didn't um, notice that you were behaving. No, my strangely. parents, my parents absolutely knew that things were going downhill, but I was not a kid. You couldn't punish me. So unless you hit me, which my parents weren't about that, um, there was nothing you could do. So for example, when I was, I think 12, they tried to ground me. I said, no, <laughs> they said, and you know, I, I discovered this thing that kids don't know. And I want to say, pray Shh, God, my kids never yeah, figured this out. Kids. Yeah. There, if you say no, it's pretty hard to make, like, unless you're going to beat them physically, right? right. What it, what are they going to do? Take your stuff? So I was like, great, take my stuff. I'm still not going to stay in this room. Okay, are you going to physically hold me here? So they would take the door and I would just leave. <laughs> and I would come I would, I would leave the house. And I I, wow. I researched and and found that you could not legally lock a child in or out of the house. So my parents so I knew legally that that was you know what was allowed and I just refused to be parented refused okay. was unwilling and and um what that looked like I would be in my bedroom when I was in high school and my dad would come in and I'd light a cigarette and start smoking in the house I like I I I mean I, I can't even begin to tell you like the level I mean it's horrifying now but I just was unwilling to cooperate and be and be parented and what i what i fundamentally came to understand was the person who said no has all the power that i had all the power that they couldn't make me do anything and that the fact that i was doing that completely disrupted the whole system yeah. um unfortunately i have two not unfortunately but unfortunately for everyone um i have two younger sisters um one who's two years younger and one who's five years younger than me and they um you know, they suffered as a result of my behavior. And for that, I am, um, you know, definitely uh, wish that I could change some of that. Um, but I just was angry. And, um, and then when I was 16, so, uh, you know, another example, so my boyfriend, um, the guy who first put a needle in my arm when I was 15, um, he was 14 years older than me. Um, and, I, uh, and it got to the point with my parents and who knew him and it got to the point with my parents where they let him move in because they were so terrified that I wouldn't come home at night. And the only way that they knew that I would come home at night is if he was in the house. Wow. And Your so parents must have they been terrified. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so they were so afraid that I was going to die every single night and they didn't even know I was shooting heroin yet. Um, that they, because I would just leave if, if there was an altercation, like I would just leave. And, um, I created a network of resources outside of my family and that allowed me to just leave. Um, I'm taking a, I'm, I'm in business school, uh, right now and I'm taking a negotiation class and, um, you know, I, like this was stuff, you know, your best alternative to a negotiated agreement, you know, you're bad at like you walk away. And I fundamentally understood that if you have nothing they can take from you, if you don't comply, there's nothing they can do. Right. And while that was effective in terms of letting me do these crazy things, it, it destroyed the relationship and it made it so that I spiraled down so fast, right? So I got sober when I was 19. And even that is late in the game, because I was, you know, in treatment for two years. So, um, you know, to wrap wrap up this piece, which is, um, you know, I started shooting heroin, and everything that comes along with that. And I was living with my boyfriend in East Palo Alto, um, he had an apartment there. And um, we had just robbed a computer store. 
and um, we were doing all sorts of, you know, drug related things. And uh, we got in a fight. He left the house and um, I had a broken foot that I had been living with for three months that I hadn't taken to the doctor. So I'm limping around my drug dealer asked me if I was okay, like was concerned about my well being, which was what point where I sort of had this look with him like, so you're not really concerned about my well being, let's be honest. <laughs> um, but so this broken foot w- wasn't, you know, wasn't treating that whatever. So was in this house and um, the police come in, they, uh, I'm the only one there, and <laughs> they arrest me and, um, and a, ser- a long Uh, road of the legal system proceed I became a ward of the state of California at 16 and um, and my parents uh, illegally uh, took had me taken by force to a wilderness program where I arrived with my hair falling out at 16 with my hair falling out um, completely strung out with a broken foot and turned out I was pregnant (sighs) So um, that was how I arrived to wilderness. <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, and I went through a series of um, of treatment centers, different treatment centers. Um, a lockdown in Utah for ten months, um, which was very traumatic. Um, and then I went to um, another treatment center for ten months. Um, and so I ended up going to about eight different programs. Um, and I got out of programs by the time I was 18 and um, then tried the great experiment of I can drink or I can drink, but I'm not going to do drugs. I'm a drug addict, but I'm not an alcoholic. And um, that landed me. So that worked for a few months, not really. And um, I ended up I was living in Prescott, Arizona, and I ended up in Phoenix. I drove my car down to Phoenix and um, went into a trailer park and started knocking on all the doors and asking for heroin, if anyone had heroin, because I didn't know where to find it. And I found a trailer that had it, and they all had rusty, dirty rigs, and there was no place for me to go to get clean ones. So I rinsed them out with Clorox from under the trailer, you know, but in bathroom. And I tried to do all these little shots in my arms so that I wouldn't overdose. And the result of that was that I infected all the veins in my arms. Um, So my bottom, if you will, was that um, I ended up 100 miles away from that trailer park. Don't know where my car was with two guys who who had my drugs. My arms were stuck out in front of me and I could not move them because they were it was I was in so much pain. And I was begging for these people to give me drugs because I had been rendered incapable of actual using. And this was in my pursuit of I can drink but not do drugs. And um, my mom came and visited me in the hospital, which I ended up in the hospital. And she asked me if I was going to make her bury me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I got sober at 19. My, my sobriety date is January 7th, 2006. And um, it's been a crazy wild journey, uh, getting sober at 19 and being sober, going to college sober, getting married sober, having children sober. Um, and it's been an, an amazing, an amazing journey. And most of it is heavily uh, rooted in Alcoholics Anonymous for me. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Oh my God. I have so many questions. <laughs> Give me your question. <laughs> you're like, go. Oh. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that is incredible. I, you know, you're, I mean, let's face it. You're super lucky. I mean, how many times <laughs> have we heard about, I mean, you know, you, you spend any t- amount of time in the recovery communities and then you hear about moms who've lost their children. I think in 2017, there were like 70,000 deaths, oh. op- opiate related deaths, just opiates, 70,000, you know? <laughs> It's really, um, I, you know, I didn't mention this, but in, on May 17th of 2004, my dad found me blue from a heroin overdose Oof. in my childhood bedroom. Um, there was no re- he ha- just happened to come into the room because I had an appointment. He would have never come in the room otherwise. Oh and God. I was home between treatment center. The only time I was ever home between treatment centers. 
and um, they, you know, cut off my sweatshirt and used, you know, did CPR and used the paramedics had Narcan. Oh, they did. And it saved my life. Yeah. And um, otherwise, I would not have been, it, you know, I would not have made it. And so, um, and and that experiment, I actually talked about this. Um, I did on Overdose Awareness Day. That experiment, I was drinking, and I blacked out. And yeah. apparently went and got, I have zero recollection. I don't even know how I knew where to get it at that point. Cause I had been gone so long. I came out of an alcohol blackout having had a heroin overdose. Like don't know what happened in between. Just know that they found me with a bungee cord around my arm and a, and a syringe on the ground and I had overdosed. So, you know, I have, I am very passionate about the fact that, you know, whatever affects you from the neck up, if you are, if you are seeking to feel differently than you feel, don't worry about drug of choice. Cause it honestly, it, 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 it's a little game we play with ourselves. Most of us, are there some people that can do it? Probably. Uh, but you know, that's a risk you have to take. Are you, are you going to be in that? Are you going to be in that cohort? And if you're not, the price to pay is quite high. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I first got sober, they said, if you're sober long enough, you'll, you'll go to a lot of funerals. I've been sober a long time. And I've been to a lot of funerals for a variety of reasons. I mean, um, the, um, the price tag of that experiment is typically just so high, it's, it's just not worth it. But we do have to answer the question, you know, am I powerless over this too? Right? And that was, you know, a question that it sounds like you, you, you know, they say that in the in the 12 step rooms that you have to concede to your innermost self, that you are completely powerless. And in my mind, it doesn't matter what the addiction is, it's, it serves, it all serves the same purpose, which is to distract from our pain. And if we go back to, you know, five years old, um, I remember we were talking before about, uh, you know, that situation with the, the pastor's son, and all the things that happened to you during that, you know, having to recant, didn't you say you had to recant the story like you told, and then you had to recant? Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, I came, so the, this happened in Boston and then I didn't tell anyone. Um, I, I he, from what I remember, which is you were young, getting to be less and less, unfortunately, yeah. um, or fortunately, um, he told, he, there was some threat or something not to tell, but I was, you know, I, I don't remember what that was about. Um, but so when we moved to California, I thought that I had seen him. And so I told my, my, uh, my babysitter who I confided in and my babysitter convinced me to tell my parents and my dad told me to tell the school therapist, um, who then proceeded to, um, tell many parents and people at the school. Um, it was outrageous. Yes, it was, it's, yeah, that's, that's definitely a, it's, it's like a, resentment that kind of comes and goes it's 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 light but it's i think it would still there um but anyhow she it is what you know and and so then um it was a long game of telephone it got to the principles that um that 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 me and my sisters were in danger and cps was going to be called and so ultimately i was told that if i did not recant what i had told the therapist that my sisters would go to a foster care. Foster care. Yeah. And so I was marched in there. I was nine years old and marched into the principal's office, the male principal's office. Oh. And I recanted. And, you know, that I think for me, that is probably the biggest trauma in my entire life. And I, <laughs> I mean, and I could tell you a gazillion stories of crazy things that had happened while I was doing, you know, Crazy drugs and what have you. Do you feel like that was but, like the first? I mean, there's there's the incident of the abuse at five, but do you feel like the trauma at nine was like the first real betrayal, or you know what I'm saying? Yes. So, uh, you remember I was telling you I refused to be parented. Yeah. I at that moment I'll, I'll never forget this because I, I I remember very clearly go thinking to myself, Oh, I don't have parents, which is a weird 
thing to think. Obviously, I have parents who love me very much. Um, they were working with the tools they had at the time, which I get. And um, you know, they very much regret what happened. Um, they were trying to make incredibly difficult decisions with very little time and new knowledge to them and and no experience with this right and um yeah and it didn't go well and uh so for me it ended my feeling of um was that trust or trust or or authority like it just ended their authority for me they it 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 made it like i was they were roommates who love like the relationship the right. foundation of the relationship changed for me. I, right. I, I really understood somewhere that I was on my own and that changed who I was in yes. terms of how I interacted with my parents. And so the crazy stuff at home, like the absolute outrageous, unwilling, like who is this kid? That's a kid who was not afraid of anything her parents could or could not do or give her anything. And I knew that if I had nothing, if I didn't care about anything that they took, that they had, there was nothing to do. There's no way to parent me. There's no way to stop me. And a lot of that came from, you know, this rage about rage. being, yeah, rage. about being, yeah. yeah, about being betrayed. And I had a lot of rage. I had one of the, um, I was in a family week and oh, it was just like my heart. Um, and we were doing some family work and amends. And um, I, one of my, um, one of my amends and my, you know, how I was going to make up that amends was I promised to never lay a hand on any of my family members ever again. And I remember thinking to myself at, I think I was 17 um, at that time, like, that's the type of thing you say in kindergarten. Like, that's not the type of thing that, you know, like I'll never lay another hand on you, but that I was so, I was filled with so much rage and rage is heavy. It's, it's, I remember when it lifted, it lifted, um, it lifted early, uh, you know, between 18 and 19 and mm. it lifted. And I remember that because the rage was tight and it made me, um, Def like physically defensive and aggressive. And um, I remember that act that feeling going away. And it's funny, I, it, it would, I can't, I don't know what it would take for that feeling to come back. It hasn't in so long, but the fact that it was such a physical manifestation for me um, and, and having to work through that. And I, I did ultimately do the work to work through that. What was it that, uh, what, what press what, what what preceded the uh, rage lifting? Like, how did you get rid of it? Like, how did it lift? Oh, God, I wish I remembered. I think I think really what what I can say during that time what happened was that I took responsibility mm. and I I really looked at the fact because in my case and this is just my story it was easy to see that my parents love me to death and that they their desire was not not to hurt me they had no they had no there was no value for them in that there, there was no <laughs> they, did, yeah. they didn't get anything out of that and so i was able to really see that they fucked up they fucked up they're just human and they're just human and and i was able to put myself in their shoes um as much as i could at the time and yeah, i was no, able I was able to see that my resentments were t me taking poison and waiting for them to die. And it yeah. was just, and I was miserable, just miserable. My life, I was constantly being caged constantly. I just, you know, I went from program to program. I was in a year long lockdown and it was miserable. And I, I mean, I counted, I can't tell you how much of my teen years were spent counting down the days to my 18th birthday. And, oh. um, I'll, you know, I, I'll never forget waking up on my 18th birthday in treatment and the cake that my friends hobbled together and thinking I, I, I have agency for the first time in my life. Mm -hmm. I could, I could leave. And, um, I, I didn't have that. I kept, I, I was in hospitals. I was in institutions, um, constantly because my disease that's where my disease takes me and it takes me there really fast so i think that just 
feeling like res- having some responsibility, some sense of the fact that I was struggling with addiction, starting to under- like understand how addiction works in the brain, what was going on. Like I wasn't insane. I had this specific problem and I could do these specific things to get better. Um, so all of that, I think, allowed the the rage to kind of lift piece by piece until I just remember um, there was a situation that would have normally caused that rage and I just wasn't there. I just couldn't get worked up enough. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I I heard, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Tara Brock. She's a Buddhist meditation therapist, teacher. Oh my God. She's magical. If if you haven't been introduced to her yet, you would love her. But I was listening. She wrote two books, Radical Compassion and Radical Acceptance. And I can't remember. Yeah. So good. Uh, so good. Um, but she said something that I had never heard in 26 years of recovery, which was that anger is a sign of an unmet need. And when you were talking about this little girl who was just so full of rage, what was it at nine years old that you needed that you didn't get? <laughs> um, I laugh because I think it's a long list, but uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, the, the, I needed someone to believe me. I think oh. that was, you know, that was the piece for me. No one was going to change what happened. No one, you know, that wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, whether I got support or not, um, you know, it was, it was a complicated situation. Um, I, I, I wasn't violent. Uh, so, you know, I, I was very confusing. Um, I needed someone, I needed to know that if I said that something had happened, that I'd be believed. And there's something particularly around trauma or abuse. There is something about not being believed about what, you know, about you come out and you say this thing that you haven't been telling anyone that it's you know, not convenient for anyone that you don't want to talk about, you know, that you're starting to under, you know, that's the other thing when you're abused at five, you don't understand what the hell's going on. Yeah. As I got older, the pieces started coming together. Right. And the memories started coming together. So here it's, it's, it's a, it's a, that's a complicated thing um, to go, to have something happen and have no understanding and then piece the understanding together. Um, and also I, I hit puberty very, very young very, very young. And, and so started growing pubic hair when I was like seven years old. So that is young. They thought of, they thought about, um, doing hormone shots to slow my progression down, but didn't. So it was like, you know, I was a mess. Lots and, of, lots of hormones on top of, I mean, what you yeah. were describing to, when you were talking about that, what came up for me was just like the invalidation, like invalidating yeah. you. Yep. And, yep. um, yeah, no wonder, no wonder you were, yeah. And, 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 and also for me, a big coping mechanism is dis- disassociation. disassociation, huge coping because yeah. I had to stay in that school that happened in third grade. I graduated from that school in eighth grade. Oh my God. So all the parents that knew all the teachers, I, I dated a guy who lived in my neighborhood, um, when I was in eighth grade and he was a freshman at um, local high school and th- his mother uh, was best friends with a first grade teacher at my, at my school. And she told the mother of the guy I was dating that I had been abused as a kid. And sh- the mother made him break up with me because of it <sighs> when I was in eighth grade. Yeah. Real nice. But l- that's, it was like, I'm that girl, right? I'm that kid. And, and then I'm hitting puberty and then I'm, you know, rebelling. And then I'm a woman at 13. I mean, fully, <laughs> I was, you know, in these pictures of me, it's like, no wonder I just, it was, it was yeah. always going to be a complete shit show. And I needed my parents to show up for me and believe. And part of that is believing what I was saying. Right. Yeah. My goodness. Well, no wonder. <laughs> no wonder. No <laughs> but, wonder. You know, you know what? I don't think that's what makes me an alcoholic. <laughs> well, I it sure I as don't. shit didn't help. I mean, oh, no, don't you th- don't you think that a lot of 
I mean, in my experience, a lot of addiction and alcoholism and all that stuff is around medicating feelings. And you had described mental illness in your family, as well as like, you know, the waspy mom who may, may not know how to um, cope with feelings. Like if I mean, if you don't have them, or you're repressed, yeah. you know, then you don't know how to manage um, what I would consider to be huge feelings like trauma and invalidation and rage. I mean, you're talking about really powerful emotions. So I can't imagine she had any kind of uh, coping skills to share with you. Yeah, I, no, um, <laughs> she, my dad had some, um, her, hers, not so much. Um, you know, it's her, tra- I should say her transformation since all of this has been amazing. She's, you know, one of my best friends and, and she's come so far. Yeah. Um, she was just working with what she had. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing to see that too. It's amazing to, for her to, for, for us to have conversations where of what I interpreted. And I think about that with my kids too, you know, situations that I interpreted my parents would, um, we would suddenly, you know, need a budget for something. And I would interpret that as we were, we were poor and we were going to lose the house. And so conversations where there was like conversation Mm -hmm. about a budget or something and, and, and sticking to a budget to me that that's what I interpreted. So I think a lot about how, you know, I have two younger sisters, they interpreted things differently. Mm -hmm. And I, I think part of how I interpret things is, part of my alcoholism. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it's kind of like, it, you know, I don't know, it's chicken and egg, but I, I, you know, from day one, I was, you know, I, I, I overdo everything and I'm too much for everyone. Right. Like I'm just, I'm too much for the people at school. I'm too much. I'm too much. I'm too much. Like, it's just, I have my personality, my being, my belief, I'm just too intense. And, um, there was a lot, you know, my drugs of choice, um, you know, my ultimate drugs of choice, you know, alcohol, um, and heroin, like that made me a small person, a quiet person. It put me to sleep. I was not, um, uh, I did a lot of math, but I don't actually like it, which gives you an idea of <laughs> I get my it. addiction. Um, I'm like, why am I doing this? I hate this stuff. Um, <laughs> But, uh, but, you know, I was not interested in being up all the time and being awake and being aware and engaging like that. I wanted nothing to do with that. I wanted to be nodding off and asleep. Yeah. I wanted to be, be small. Um, Pink Floyd's comfortably numb. That was like my anthem. I, to- I yeah. just didn't want to totally. be, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I just didn't want to feel any of it. So I totally get it. So you said that you ultimately took responsibility and you were able to empathize is kind of what I was hearing that you were able to empathize with your parents. And it sounds like you just got sick and tired being sick and tired and but more along the lines of tired of being angry. Like, that's exhausting. It was exhausting. And you know, it's funny is that that happened before I actually got sober. So I still ended up drinking after that, you know, kind of catharsis. But um, it was a very... uh, pivotal part of my recovery. My dad says, um, my dad says that one day I said to him when I was 17, um, dad, you may have been the worst parents of all time, but me hurting myself every day. Some, this is some form of it. Me hurting myself every day, um, to get back at you is, you know, something to the effect of like, is not helping anyone. And so I'm going to take responsibility for my life. I have zero recollection of this conversation, but Interesting. that's the story. My dad says that I basically was like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, what am I doing? Um, and I think the fact that I constantly was put away, like literally physically <laughs> put into programs and institutions, that um, loss of of agency over and over again. And for long stretches of time, um, on the one hand, I'm really lucky that my family was able to provide, you know, you know, to pay for treatment and that I was able to have, um, the opportunity to do some of that work. And, and, you know, on the other side of that coin was, um, you know, just a lot of, um, a, a, a lot, a big holding pattern for me, you know, just holding me somewhere so that I wouldn't hurt myself. Right. Yeah. Um, but that wasn't a huge, that a lot of that wasn't growth in a good way. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, I get that. Um, 
I hesitate to ask, but you, you mentioned, you know, showing up at 16 with a broken foot and pregnant and you had, oh, your hair was falling out and all that. Were you, what, what, you know, what, what happened to that pregnancy? Did they make you terminate that pregnancy or did you lose it or what happened? So it was kind of a combination of things. Um, so I showed up, uh, I broke my foot at a concert in a beer garden and just like never dealt I don't know I don't I couldn't tell you um I think the fact that I was shooting a painkiller helped um but uh so I arrived there could just absolutely a disaster and then this happened and my poor parents I was heinous when they when they took me uh, uh, when they convinced me to sleep I wasn't living at home they convinced me to sleep at home and then they had the people come and I was so strung out and I had this broken foot. So I wasn't going anywhere. Like there was no running. There was no like great plan. <laughs> no. And I knew it too. I knew it. I just said to them, I go, if you let me smoke, I'll cooperate. Um, so, you know, they gave me a pack of cigarettes and we were I was like, whatever, I'm so screwed here. And, um, and I was heinous. I wrote a letter that my dad still has, if you can even call it that, um, you know, just horrible. I spit in his face. Um, you know, just really awful. Um, well, as Jekyll and be- Hyde. I mean, we don't, there's a reason drugs are illegal. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> well, the way I do them. Yes. Um, and I, and I was super strung out and I was pregnant. And the thing about the pregnancy was I thought the morning sickness was dope sickness. So I was using copious amounts of chemicals to try to feel better. Because yeah. I didn't know what was going on. And um, and so the pregnancy probably wasn't viable. I don't really remember what happened. Um, I, I was complicit in, in it. Um, but it, we went to a hospital in Utah. I was in, in Salt Lake City. And they make you watch these horrible videos. Oh. And it was, I was just like, you know, uh, already such a like what is happening but oh the story so when they pick you up when they when they when your parents pay to have these people come get you and take you to wilderness they're told yes your loved one is going to be livid and they're going to be pissed and they're going to say things and blah 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 blah, blah. they're going to fight you but after the six weeks they will have detox we will have worked with them that's when you'll come out and your experience with them will be a lot different mm-hmm. so just hang on and withstand the pissed offness of having people come, you know, take you out of your house, it'll get better. Because that I had a broken foot and was pregnant, my mom had to pick me up two days after this. Oh my God. She had to come and stay in a hotel room with me. In in and oh like, I mean, God. it was just, it was like it was, I could not manage to not complicate a situation, like even complicated situations. I managed to complicate. And, uh, and yeah. And so I, I lost that pregnancy, um, Mm. you know, which as, as someone who has kids, um, you know, that's that I understand, um, you know, how serious that is. And on the other hand, um, that is, I'm so grateful because the person that, um, my boyfriend at the time was, um, super, super abusive narcissist and, um, unwell and being tied to that person would have been, uh, a real barrier to my recovery. Um, and also I was a 16 year old strung out girl. So that was, no, I mean, it happens all the time. Right. And it's just, it's just one of those things that it's such a, it's a terribly painful, difficult situation. And, you know, so the reason I asked about that is because um, I feel like it it happens to so many women. It happens oh, to yeah. so many women. And, you know, that's definitely something, you know, we, we all um, have to forgive ourselves for all kinds of things. And um, that's just a very, that's just a terrible situation to, to have gone through. And um, yeah, and, and I totally, you know, just to say like I totally get people's opinions that are or people who've done something different um or people who have opinions about that I I get I I get the judgment I understand um 
you know, I don't even have an opinion just so you know, like, <laughs> no, yeah, I no, even... no, I just mean for your, for your yeah. listeners, like yeah, yeah, if, yeah. if, if that sounds completely horrible to you, I get it. Like if you, if you think that's monstrous or that's a monstrous decision, I get it. I totally get it. And, and it's a horrible situation to be in, but, um, you know, we make the decisions with, we make the decisions at the time with the information that we have. And, um, it was not a safe situation for any person or child or, and it would have not helped. Yeah. I totally get it. I probably would have have done the same thing in in that situation. I think that's totally understandable. Um, well, let's shift gears just a little bit because, um, I mean, all that you've described is so intense and it's a miracle that it's a know, miracle like, that we're talking uh, and my, your, your my life, story exhausts me. Well, I don't feel exhausted by it, but it just is a miracle that you have come so far. Right. And that's what I love about hearing people's recovery stories is that they say that no matter how far, you know, how far the scale you have done, have gone to, you know, you're, your experience will benefit others. You are now uniquely qualified to help somebody who's been in that situation. Because from my experience, it's the love and the understanding and the compassion and the empathy that helps people heal from that, right? We can't go back and change the past, but we can absolutely, you know, change our future, right? And, and, and lift those, um, lift others up who have been through something similar. Right. And so that's what you have done with your life, which is so amazing. I know that you're helping, I mean, literally thousands of people, um, through your, um, through Lion Rock and through your podcast and all your other efforts. I know you have like a really exciting event coming up. Let's t- I mean, that's a super fun. Okay. I'm a huge Gabby Bernstein fan. I love me some Danny Trejo. <laughs> and uh, Jody Sweeten, how adorable is she? And so you have this event coming up. Do you want to talk a little bit about the event and uh, what the purpose is sure. and how it helps people? Yes, absolutely. So it's called, I have a note, it's a three-part online discussion series. So I've already done two panels that were published with influencers, and then the end was this, the celebrity. Um, and it's called Getting Clean and Staying Connected. And um, I'm so excited and amazed that we were able to pull this off. Um, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's I I didn't I didn't know what it was going to look like, but um, this was I did not expect it to to have these awesome people. Um, I'm so I'm a huge Gabby Bernstein fan, um, so I'm going to try not to fangirl all over I know. her. Yeah. Um, so, because that's not a cute look. Um, I know you're trying to you're so, all trying to be cool and maintain. Yeah, and be like I'm gonna be cool. <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> and on the cool. inside, you're gonna be like, oh my god, it's coming. <laughs> totally, totally. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna have to practice in the mirror. Um, so Can I just tell I'm you, gonna... I did meet her in person once and totally fangirled out on her, and I don't even feel bad about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just have to. You know what's yeah. funny is. Uh, you know, living. I lived in LA, and now I live in Orange County, and so you know, I been around and plus in the program been around plenty of of people who have some sort of fame or status and i fangirl over the like the funniest i fangirl over the the, the strangest like if i met stephen colbert or was interviewed by stephen colbert i would (laughs) fall down fall (laughs) down i would hit my face would hit the ground like i i wouldn't know what to do with myself you would need a minute i i would i don't know what i would do i don't know (laughs) I, I literally, my, I, I would watch, uh, the Colbert report and oh my God, I would I tell him. my husband, like, I think he's the sexiest man I've ever seen. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just like, he, you know, in someone's brain and like personality is yeah. so attractive that they are attractive. Yeah. 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 Love is blind I just, girlfriend. I get it. Yeah. I get <laughs> it. Blind. Exactly. Exactly. My husband knows that if, you know, Stephen Colbert gets divorced. You got the hall pass years. for Stephen Colbert. Not Brad yeah. Pitt, like Stephen Colbert. No, but that's what I'm saying. Like I have the weirdest. <laughs> like I fangirl over some like the weirdest. Who else you, know, you got? The, Who else you got in your weird hall pass category? <laughs> weird hall pass category. I mean, this. Um, funny. God, who else? Well, okay, so like young Sean Connery, but um, and when I say young, I mean like fifties. <laughs> 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 um, that's hilarious. But, uh, 
I, I, I have a thing for, for the older guys. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't thought That's about it in a while, but the only one I thought about was Stephen Colbert <laughs> forever. It's just like, I love you so much. He's amazing. Um, I love yeah. him. Well, you'll have to, uh, hopefully you'll run into him. Okay. So, but in LA and everything, you've run into some people, but so. Yeah. Like I'll run into, you know, I've met people, um, you know, who have real fame and I, I'm very impressed by their talent and whatever, but I don't get that like, ah! you don't um, lose your shit. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't. Yeah. I've been tra- particularly living in LA. You have to like, it's not cool. To, to yeah. Not, it, you are not cool if you do if something you weird. Yeah. yeah. If you fangirl, but, um, you know, just, so you're going to have to I, hold it together in front of Gabby. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's so cute. I love her. She's great. Well, I'm so excited for you. That sounds like a great panel. When is Thank that you. happening? That so that's on National Online Recovery Day, which is December December. Sorry. National Online Recovery Day, which is September twenty second. That's right. <laughs> I was like, we need to get this podcast done before so we can promote. Yep, yep. So that September twenty second, it will be live two PM pacific time I, 2 p.m pst i will definitely put all this you'll send me a link i'll put in the show notes so that yeah. everybody and i'll definitely put it on the podcast and all these other areas that'll be really fun i'm super excited for you for that Thank you. um so i thought we might wrap up with this is my list of re- oh 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 your wrap-up questions okay let's yeah <laughs> Because right. I could talk to you forever, seriously. Uh, I know. I had so much fun on your podcast. I can't wait for that to come out. I told somebody, I was like, oh my God, I think I just gave the best interview. Like Ashley brought out the best of me. I can't wait for this podcast. I love it. <laughs> so I my love girls it. are like, when is this thing happening? Um, but um, okay, so let's do the lightning round questions. I'm ready. Are you ready? Light me up. Okay, so favorite Quitlet books, which favorite uh, recovery books. Uh, favorite recovery books. They don't necessarily have to be recovery, but like personal growth okay. or things that have helped you get sober. Okay. Okay. So things that help. So I love all of Gabby Bernstein's and, uh, book. Super attractor. Um, yeah. Super attractor. May cause um, miracles. Yeah. Universe yep, has love, your back. I am familiar. Yep, judgment, <laughs> judgment detox. Yeah. Oh, yeah I, judgment I, detox. I didn't actually read it. I had her sign it, but I didn't read it. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm actually kind of like a neuroscience nerd. <gasps> Me which, too. Uh, oh, okay. So um, I, the, there's a couple books, The Body Keeps the Score. Yes. Um, it's a really fantastic book. Comes with a workshop, a, a workshop, a workbook. Uh-huh. Um, uh, there was a really, um, Patrick Carnes wrote a book, Out of the Shadows, about sex addiction that was um, really helpful uh, for me in my early 20s in recovery um and uh, you did Melody- mention in the very beginning we, and i forgot to ask you about that you did mention that men were one of the things that i think you and you and i had <laughs> so many things in common using men to yeah. fill the void shall we say <laughs> <laughs> of, of missing feelings yeah. i meant you know okay, yeah the feelings right and here exactly. yeah. in, your, in your heart yes, yes, yes that's um, what i meant I definitely, you know, I, I definitely, that was definitely part of like making myself feel better. There's no question about that. Easy, man. And my, and, and, and my so boyfriend, easy. and my, my boyfriends and the, the guys that I dated were usually 15 to 20 years older than me. My husband is the youngest guy I've ever dated. He's four years older than I am. I am familiar. I'm actually two years older than my husband, which was. That's how wow. far the other way I went. That's how, yeah, yeah, that's your recovery going. Going the other way. Yeah, I figure he's <laughs> probably, yeah, well, you know, women years are different, right? He's probably yep. like 10 years younger than me in woman years. <laughs> woman years, I swear. <laughs> oh, that is like, okay, so the Patrick Carnes, um, Out of the Shadows, that was uh, uh, sexuality related or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so women yeah, do so not I, talk I, about that enough. I don't think, do you, we don't really talk about sex all that much. We, no, we don't. I, th- I think we go b- between sex and lo- so sex and love addiction and it flip flops, right. You can be yeah. in one. And then, um, and if you just, dis- 
you're a dissociator like I am, where you can literally have no feelings. Like I can, um, sometimes when I do feelings work, I have to ask myself if I were having a feeling, what would it be? Cause I have to think the feeling oh, and then, then try. Yeah. So like I, so, so being a woman who can like completely turn off any kind of feelings that was, you know, useful for dating, not so useful for so, yes, it's, spiritual it's a, growth. Yeah. It's a survival <laughs> mechanism, right? But yeah. then we yeah. have to yeah. learn to let go of our survival tools. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. I will definitely leave that. I'm, I haven't read that one. I'm going to totally add that, add it to the list. I'm obsessed with um, Audible. I think I have like 120 yes. titles yes. on my phone at the moment. All right. Um, bright. Uh, so my favorite one recently is Bright Line Eating. Um, Bright Line right. Eating. Susan Pierce Thompson. She is uh, over 20 years in recovery. Um, many year in substance abuse recovery uh, was in OA for 10 years, but started this program called Bright Line Eating, um, which is a recovery program that I am in. And mm. she is a neuroscientist. And Ooh. it's her book is amazing. It like. I, I don't want to describe it because I'll just do a terrible job of, of, of like giving the message, but bright line eating, if you're struggling with um, eating disorder or weight or any of that, she talks about the neuroscience of it. She talks about, um, you know, what we do, what we need to do. Um, and it's just phenomenal. Okay. Love me some neuro. I love science. I mean, I, and I love how science, especially brain science, you know, I'm mm-hmm. obsessed with, um, with the subconscious mind and how to change yes. limiting beliefs and, and all those things. Um, cause I feel like we, we allow into our lives what we believe we deserve. Right. And if we change what we believe we deserve, like at a subconscious level, then the outside begins to change too. So I love yeah. all that stuff. Okay. So that's it. That's it. Was there anything else you wanted to add to the quit lick books? or self-improvement development books. Okay. Um, do you have a mantra or quote? I know there's like a lot of little 12 step sayings and stuff. Do you have any that you live by? Um, (laughs) so I have a quote tattooed on my wrist. Oh, that's a good one. Um, which is, um, to err is human to forgive is divine. Mm. Um, and it's an Alexander Pope quote. I'm not sure that I, 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 it's an important quote. I don't know that it's my, my mantra. Um, my, so my mantra has become um, that you are meant to feel good and have a good time. Mm-hmm. I did not know that life was about feeling good and having a good time. I didn't know life was supposed to be enjoyable. I thought that life was you're supposed to grind it out and then everything's supposed to be miserable and you're just supposed to grit your teeth and work as hard as you can and you'll get blips of enjoyable but most of it's going to be just who can work the hardest and then at the end you'll get a prize or whatever you'll get you know the money or this or the that and I did I fundamentally did not understand that the point the goal is to feel good. I just didn't get that. Yeah. And it particularly in sobriety, I think I got that part in, 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 uh, while I was using, but, um, not in sobriety. And so my mantra has been, you know, I, I am one of those people that's chronically busy, chronically overworking, um, you know, overdoing stuff. And, um, I ask myself, like, am I enjoying this? Is mm-hmm. this, you, you know, I never used to ask myself that. If I was miserable, I just pushed through it, pushed harder, uh, worked harder, whatever it was. And so now my mantra is kind of like, are you having, are, are you enjoying this? Um, and sometimes, you know, I'm in business school, like, there's a lot of stuff that's not enjoyable. And there's a lot of homework that I do not want to do and that I'm exhausted working full time and doing all the things yeah, that I do. Lot. But do I enjoy the content? Am I like, am I like, do I, you know, I, so it's not like, well, I don't enjoy vacuuming, so I'm not going to vacuum. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a balance. Right. Well, it's more like, do I enjoy what this brings me? Mm -hmm. Um, Or, or am I doing it for some other reason? Because really about feeling good. Do I feel good? Um, One of the things that I ask people to do who, um, who I sponsor and work with is, to write down how they want to feel at work, not what they want to do, uh, but how they want to feel while they're, while they're doing whatever it is. 
they're doing. Do they want to feel excited? Do they want to feel connected to people? Do they want to feel, uh, you know, precise? Do they want to feel um, accomplished, organized? Uh, you know, what are the feelings? How do you want to feel while you're doing your work? And back into that, because I just didn't understand for so long, which feels crazy to me now, um, that life was supposed to be enjoyable. Well, you know, it's funny because we, you know, we do drugs because we, you know, on the outside, it looks like you do drugs so that you can have fun. Right. right. And that's how we enjoy life. But that's not the yeah. case. It's not, it's not really, especially in addiction, it's just a lot of work. Right. It's and so much work. And being it's- high is, you know, and then you don't remember it. So, I mean, did you and really have fun? A, Who knows? It, and, and, and with, you know, one thing that, <laughs> with you asked one of your guests, what do you wish you knew? What do you wish you had known? Um, I did not know that with heroin, once you're addicted, you get sick and you get well, you don't get high, you get well. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know that. That's, um, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So, so you, after, after you become addicted, you're just not, you're just taking drugs so that you're not sick. Right. Dope sick. So now, now it's a dope. Now, now it's just a, a an endless, Pursuit, uh, of. pursuit of stopping yourself from getting this horrendous, you know, we've all seen movies, you know, depictions. And let me tell you, it, it it's brutal. Um, and so you're just running. You're just running from running this from it. feeling. Yeah, but oh I had God, no idea. Ashley. I had no idea it was like, I mean, cocaine wasn't like that. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> Cocaine stopped working, but it wasn't, you know, so. I mean, you get a little um, nosebleed. It's okay. <laughs> You know, it stopped doing what I needed yeah. it to do, but but it didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't running away from from serious, serious. Like and and like you still got something from it, and you know um, that just goes to that. The description of that is nothing even remotely fun. Right. Right. Nothing fun about it. Well, since you brought it up, um, do you? What is one thing you wish you would have known when you first got sober? Uh, I wrote this down. I think you did your thing, homework. Good for you. I know. I know. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I wrote it. I know. Sorry. Um, I love it. Uh, that the goal in life is to feel good and have fun. Got it. Yeah. It's so funny because I think, uh, you know, a lot of people when they first get sober, they're like, oh my God, I'm going to have to stop drinking and doing drugs or smoking. I'll, I'll never have fun again. Never have fun again. And that is, couldn't, couldn't be further from the truth. I have so much fun in recovery. I bet you do too. You're, you seem I do. like a fun well, girl. <laughs> okay. Okay. So my twenties were killer. My twenties yeah. were killer. So fun. Uh, I have overbooked myself in my thirties with the twins and the work and the podcast and school, but um, I will come out of this. But my twenties, I mean, I jumped out of planes. I went to raves. I, you know, sober, but yeah, so I bungee jumped. I swam. No, not sober raves. I mean, I was sober, but not right. right, right. You were uh, sober, but they were. Yeah. I, I went to, went to Vegas and we went and swam with great white sharks in Africa. we, like, I mean, we, I lived large. I was going to say, you always have this fun. element of death, airplanes and sharks. Oh, yeah. my, and- my mom, my mom goes, my mom is like, do you always have to try to kill yourself? I'm like, I'm not trying to kill myself, mom. <laughs> my poor mother. I just, oh God. And now I have twin boys. So it's, it's the, yeah. I, I Well, I like excitement. I like yeah. fun. That's excitement is fun to me. Yeah, and well, and I'm, you know, I'm always too it. much. I'm always too much for people, remember? So I'm, it's yeah. always, but in my 20s, when we weren't drinking, um, you know, and I had this big group of friends and we, we lived in LA and young people in AA. And oh, so fun. That that big, too much intensity was so helpful because yeah. I got this other group of people to do things that they, you know, can hop in the car and go on a road trip or go do these things that, you know, maybe they wouldn't have done, but because, because we were sober and because we had to find new ways to enjoy our life. Right. Yeah. That became an asset because I was adventurous, but yeah, so twenties were super fun. And when people that talk, talk about like not having fun in sobriety or, you know, I'll never have fun again. I have a gazillion stories of just absolutely having a blast and you, parenthood kind of changes the yeah. game. Yeah, yeah, that'll throw a wrench in your game. Those little cockblockers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly, 
Exactly. I get it. Oh, I love that. Um, and then because my podcast is one day at a time, Odat, um, I always like to end with, uh, do you have like a regular self-care routine like that you do like one day? Is it like a, like for me, it's like a one day at a time thing. And I have like a, a daily routine, but do you have a daily self-care routine or weekly self-care routine that helps you to stay sober? Yeah. So I'm usually woken up, um, like being shot out of a cannon, um, (laughs) by one of my kids and I get up and I go and, um, intentionally hug them and talk Mm. to them. You know, they're, they have a lot of energy at 6 Mm a.m. And, uh, but I go and I talk to them and I, I hug them and kiss them and give them attention. You know, I'm, I'm a working mom and, and, um, you know, they feel that. And so I spend that time with them in the morning, uh, really just trying to be as present as anyone can be at 6 a.m. And um, and then I get my coffee and um, do a gratitude list while they're Mm -hmm. playing. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I go through um, what self-care I'm going to do in the day. So sometimes I'll do that the night before. Sometimes I'll figure out with my schedule, like, okay, what can I fit in? Can I? um, you know, get a spin class in, can I, you know, 20 minutes swim, whatever, whatever it is, you know, I try to figure out where I can fit that piece in and I put it onto my calendar because nothing happens in my life that isn't on my calendar. So I just put it in there. It doesn't have, doesn't go on the calendar. It doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 What about meetings? Do you have like a number of meetings that you like to go to? Are you still doing, are you doing online meetings? Are you doing it? Like, where does that fit in? Yeah. So COVID has, you know, obviously put a real wrench in that, but, um, I have a home group in Laguna beach and, Mm. um, 7am at uh, the Canyon club. And so I meet my sponsor there every weekend, um, go to the seven, I've been going to that meeting, you know, since I got almost since I got sober. So a lot of those people, um, have seen me, a lot of the people in there have seen me grow up and, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, uh, then I do an OA meeting on Fridays, uh, an Overeaters Anonymous meeting uh-huh. on Fridays. On Wednesdays, I do a um, mastermind group with my Bright Line Eating uh, crew. And then um, uh, Mondays, I either do another OA meeting or uh, an, online a- an online AA meeting. Um and sometimes I can join the 7 a.m. meeting um, during the week on my phone um, while I'm cooking breakfast or doing whatever. So oh, that's, that's nice. kind of been, I mean, that's like kind of post-COVID era uh, schedule. But um, it is so important to engage and connect. And I went to my first in-person, my sponsor took 28 years. And I went to go see her and we had the meeting oh, at the nice. Canyon Club parking lot. And... Um, I can't tell you how great it was to just, you know, see people and connect. And Mm. so however the connection, however you can make the connection um, is wonderful. We started um, a non-denominational, if you will, um, support group called Community, um, which is on lionrock.life. And um, it's basically, it's basically an alternative to 12 step where, um, you know, we took out the, the God piece, the religious piece Mm -hmm. that people really object to. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's free form. You can be recovering from whatever. Um, and, uh, because we, you know, like she recovers, we believe that people are always, you know, all people are recovering from something. And so it's very, very inclusive. And, um, and so I've been helping with that and, you know, doing mentorship there. So I just, I, you know, do try to do as much as I can to stay connected for me um, of service. I I find that when I'm connected, I'm automatic. Like I don't have to try to be of service. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm connected, then I'm, it happens. Um, But uh, my alcohol, my, you know, type of alcoholism, um, whereas like my husband's not the same um, requires constant monitoring constant uh, constant modern yeah. yeah my i yeah i am not the person who can like lay back and take it easy with my recovery i'm just not i w- i really wish i was I, my 
my husband drives me nuts where, you know, he'll be, he'll be, it just doesn't manifest for him. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just, I have a deep desire to be, you know, in a, in a gutter shooting heroin, you know, whatever. Like, I just don't know what that, I can't, I can't tell you, you know, when I, when I fantasize about drinking or using, it's just this like horror scene of like, and, and people be like, doesn't that look awful? I'm like, that looks so good. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? You know, they're looking at the city totally different. I know. Right? Like, yeah. You, you know, I'm like a gallon of vodka alone in a room with no lights. And, you know, are you kidding? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, it's like totally. So my brand of alcoholism, if you will, just requires constant because it comes out, you know, with, with food as a, the reason that I go to more food meetings is because that's where my alcoholism shows up more today. Yeah. That, that's the topic I have to be talking about and vigilant because I have alcoholic foods in my life where right. I treat them like alcohol and there you go. Yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. And my mind, and it's interesting because there's a 12 step program for everything. So it kind of leads me to believe like, it doesn't matter what the solution or the problem totally. is. The solution's always the same, but it, there is so much benefit in being around people who get your kind of crazy, like your flavor totally. of crazy, right? There is so much. I benefit. need, I need people. Yeah. Cause otherwise I'm too much. I'm yeah. too much. Yeah. You know? You've said it's that a few times. I'm too much. And, and, uh, and I just feel like, you know, your vibe attracts your tribe, you know, there it's, you are not too much for everyone. You know what I mean? There's no, a lot I of have, us. There's a lot of us yeah. that are too much. But I, but I'm with my people, right? Yeah, I'm with yeah. my people, but that's my, by going to be and being with people with my brand of, of crazy. Yeah. I, I'm, they get it. I, you know, I can it's tell normal. Yeah. Like I can tell a meth lab story and no one bats an eye whereas I once did that at Thanksgiving and it didn't go over so well um <laughs> I was like guys it's hysterical they're like it's not that fun actually I'm like no 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 no. you guys are okay yeah I was in danger blah 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 blah, but blah, I, blah, blah. yeah yeah my mom's just like I can't breathe, uh, I can't breathe. but <laughs> but you know I'm with my when when I'm yeah. with my people you know I'm not you know, it's not, it's not jarring for them. So I think it, I think everybody needs that, whatever that yeah. is. You know? I remember like early on in recovery, uh, I started going to, um, I start, I went back to church when I had little kids and I went on this women's retreat and I oh, remember, man. I could just, I can picture this. <laughs> Do you already know oh, what I'm going to say? I don't, I just, I'm picturing you. Yeah. Trying early recovery. Oh, yeah. Well, oh not God. so early, but still like, you know, I didn't have the perspective that I have now. Mm. <laughs> and um, I was at this women's retreat and it was like, I was, I remember telling a story and then like the quiet that fell over the yes, room. Yes. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Where you're I was like, like no. so you guys didn't um, get topless at a family right. restaurant. That is that weird? <laughs> and and it's You've always never done that? for me. What's, am what's amazing. is like, it's always the stories that we think are mild. <laughs> we're, we're telling we're telling the mild like you topless at the restaurant at a family restaurant that's mild yeah right like you're, you're right. you yeah. think you you think you're fitting in with the church crowd yeah meanwhile you completely missed the mark it, they're it's all just, yeah you do <laughs> right so funny you're, the you're other thing that yourself like I know. The other thing that I think is hilarious is how people in recovery suddenly become such prudes because oh, yeah. I, I tell this story all the time um, about how that if it was in a bottle, a bag, or blue jeans, I was doing it. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I'm, I think I'm super funny, right? And this girl yeah. pulls me aside after a meeting one time. She goes, oh, my God, I was so embarrassed for you. And I was like, bitch, please, when did you become a virgin? Did you, like, your, did your hymen grow back since you got sober? It's like, what happened to you? Um, I, yeah, I mean. Stop it. I don't know. I don't know what drives a person to to feel the need to tell you that but um talk about she waspy doesn't, she doesn't yeah right she doesn't sound like our brand of alcohol no like, no no she's not she's not i i i i'll leave you with this um <laughs> when i was in early sobriety i had the brilliant idea to sell my eggs mm -hmm. oh fun and do um, you have other children walking the planet right now no, it gets better. So I filled out, <laughs> I filled out this application. Yeah, you know, I have a lot of ideas. Um, I filled out this application and they ask you all these questions about like your lifestyle and your history. 
your physical, you know, whatever. So they like how many sexual partners you've had, if you've ever used drugs. So I wrote, I wrote in this application, what I thought was the most Pollyanna I could think of. And I was turned down because (laughs) the Pollyanna that I thought was virginal and like, you know, acceptable, like, yeah, like, like the person I created to be, (laughs) (laughs) to like be, you know, acceptable and pure was not pure enough. I mean, I just had this like, I was like, wow, I can't even like, you can't even lie about it good enough. I can't even, I, I can't, I don't even know what it looks You're like. You're like, 100 is too much? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I made this. No, I don't even remember what it was, but I made You're it. You're all three. No, I've I was like, with wait a minute. My entire yeah. Life. Yeah. yeah, I was like, this is the most I could, I like couldn't think of anything less than that. I just thought that was it would, so. It would have been like uh, realistic, right? You're yeah. like, yeah. okay, I can't yeah, say I the actual truth. But right. the watered down like, version was still weed, like, three so three times. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was like, what? <laughs> uh, you know, they're just like, we can't take someone with this kind of history. I'm like this kind of history. Like it, Girl, it blew to me. It blew my mind. It blew my mind. And <laughs> and I realized I was like, oh, I don't I will never understand at all because I can't even pretend. I cannot wait. So you're actually going to be in my neighborhood pretty soon. And in a couple weeks, yes. you're going to be out here. I can't wait to see you in person. And I cannot wait to swap actual stories with you. It's going to be. Hilarious. Oh, it's going to be good. Real good. <laughs> I can't wait. It'll oh be really goodness. good. Well, listen. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming. And I look forward to seeing you in person. And congratulations on all this amazing work that you are doing. Thank you. you are, thank we're you. healing. We're saving the world. One saving slut at a time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Your experience I mean. can help others. <laughs> yes. It takes one to know one. That's what I tell people. You spot it, you got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're like, thank, thank God it was worth something. I know, right? <laughs> Ooh, phew. Dodge that bullet. <laughs> oh, so funny. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. Uh, You are amazing. I adore you. Congratulations. And uh, I can't wait to, I'm going to be attending your Gabby, Danny, Jody thing. So yay. It's going to be awesome. November. Oh my gosh. September September 22nd. 22nd. (laughs) (laughs) I have it written down. It'll be on my calendar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Just go to the, go to the written stuff. Yeah. Go to the website. Everything's, everything will be in the show notes. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Talk to you later. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.